Tax planning mistake number four, failure to keep adequate receipts for business expenses and risk losing tax deductions if you're audited by the IRS. To me, this is so important. You know the three things you need to do to not be worried about an IRS audit? Number one is documentation. Number two, documentation. Number three, documentation. I can't overemphasize it. I've been doing audits for 40 years. They never, quite frankly, I'll be, I'll be honest with you, if you show a receipt, they accept it. They never do any background checks. They, they don't do any follow-up. Whatever you show on paper in front of them, gone, done, done, you know. I went through an audit with the lady from Fort Thomas, Kentucky last year. She was going, at, and so she got audited. She did TurboTax. Deductions were, it, it flagged it for an audit because the way, where she claimed her deductions, the, the dollar amounts, and that's how they schedule a, a client for a tax audit, is if you have excessive deductions relative to other people with your income, and they measure, the, they score your tax returns, and that's what, that's what the flag is. And I got to tell you, the audits I get are all on Schedule C's. I rarely have uh, any other, I, I have clients that sometimes, I had a client that he, their, her charitable contributions were uh, $250,000, so they wanted to get receipts, and she really was that charitable, okay? And it was easy to provide the receipt. It was a simple audit. We just sent them the receipts. There was, they didn't do any audit. I got to tell you, today, if you do an audit, guess what? This lady from Fort Thomas, they wanted every bank account she had, personal and business, okay? And they wanted every receipt that she had. Guess what? She didn't have all her receipts. So this is how you kind of work with the IRS. And I got to tell you, you, you try to put your best foot forward, so you show the documentation. But it's one of those things that you try to, um, I, I guess I feel you try to get into the agent that they they like the client and they understand the circumstances. And, 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 and so, you know, I, I will tell you this, she had a home office, and the agent, for the first time, wanted to go visit the home office in her home. When he asked me that, I said, oh, by the way, this, this audit caused her to get separated. She's no longer in the house. Okay. It was interesting. She didn't have records, you know, for some of the accounts. I also had to counsel her about her business expenses in Orlando and in California and New York City. Now, again, I don't know the, what she did, but I, I did explain to her what she needed to do. That if you have, I'll give you another example of how to plan your IRS audit. If you're out of town on tri a trip, you have to have more business days than personal days. So if you're out of town for seven days, four days have to be business days. You just can't take a trip for seven days and do business one day. IRS regulations have a rule that if you spend four hours a day, then that's business. So you have to have meetings and you have to document who you talked to, which she was able to do, that when she went to Orlando and New York City and California, and when she went to Disney in Orlando, that she, you know, she met with people for her business and she documented that for me. And there's a special rule that says if you have a meeting on Friday for four hours and you have a meeting on Monday for four hours, Friday and Monday are business days. And if you have to have meetings on Friday and Monday, then Saturday and Sunday are business days. So you only really have to work eight hours in a, in a seven day period uh, to have a seven day vacation in Orlando. Actually, the IRS regulations give an example of going to Hawaii for 14 days and working Friday and Monday on consecutive weeks, and you only have to work eight hours each week in Hawaii, and you can have a two-week vacation in Hawaii. Okay? So these are the tax rules, and, and the IRS agent, accept, well, quite frankly, it, one step further, she, she explained why she didn't have all the receipts. They didn't match up. And I was kind of shocked. I, I, I've, I've had this a couple times, quite frankly. And we got a no change on the audit. I cannot explain it. Uh, I've only had that two times. The other time was a doctor who went to H&R Block and the books were cooked. He had significant income. He had a Schedule C where they were making $300,000 in um, medical director fees. He was a doctor, right? At different hospitals and places. And um, he had a $200,000 loss in his business. You're talking about $500,000 of deductions. Now, you don't understand why he got audited? So we took the initiative, and that's what, you know, the, the, he had no receipts, nothing. So I explained to him that he moved, he lost the receipts because he didn't have any receipts. But I said, besides, 
you know, so the IRS will accept reasonable records if someone has a fire or flood, right? Or you move and you lost the records. That happens, right? So I was able to get this doctor deductions of $50,000 with no receipts on his tax return on Schedule C. So I was able to salvage something. I had to be reasonable, but we were able to identify expenses that you would expect to have. So that's something that they look at is whether it's reasonable or not. And when you have to reconstruct information when you don't have receipts, they will look at what is reasonable. Interesting, isn't it? It does work, yes. When you say receipt, is the credit card statement considered a receipt, or do you have to have that little check? Fantastic. The credit card is proof of payment like a check. That's, the, that's half of the problem you got solved. So you can, pr you can show proof of payment. You need to have a receipt for every credit card statement, every bill. So I recommend that you keep an envelope and just dump all your credit card receipts in an envelope. And if you get audited, pull out the envelope because the, they're going to have to get organized and you're going to have to provide the receipts. They don't know if you went to Home Depot and bought something for your house or bought something for the office. Okay? So it's really important to keep, that's an excellent question. That was in one of my notes, so that was a good segue. Yes? Sure. Well, let me explain the rules of that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. They can audit you for three years going back. From the time you, it, it depends when you, when you file the return, okay? So if you, if you have an extension in October, then three years from October for that year, okay? However, if you understate your income, I'm talking about income, they can go back six years if you understate it by more than 25%. So people that do not report income have a six-year window, they can audit you for six years. If they can prove that you had income not reported, they can go back six years. If there is fraud, they can go back indefinitely. There's no statute limitation. So as long as you have a clean nose, keep yourself squeaky clean, typically it's three years, okay? However, if you're selling stocks or if you have a house, I'm going to mention, interject that right now with the Trump reform. One of the changes is, is that you have to hold your house has to be your principal residence t today, two out of the past five years. The new law will be five out of eight years. Okay? So that's another example that, again, not knowing how long you're going to be in a home, I would want to keep your receipts. And the exclusion is $250,000 per person, married couples, a half a million dollars. So if you can get into that window, you're okay. But, you know, if you miss that new window, when, you know, that's going to be prospective then. If you sell down the road, they can change the rules down the road. So now I would say for your principal residence, if you make a major improvement, roof, uh, add on an addition, windows, and I will say I've had to go through audits. We showed pictures. People have owned a house for 30 years. They know that they've made improvements, and we give them numbers, and they have accepted numbers that are reasonable. You're allowed to reconstruct, but it's got to be reasonable, okay? So it gets complicated. Any other questions? One other rule of thumb I will tell you is this. We do a power of attorney with our client. My client never talked to the IRS, the lady, because she could say the wrong thing. They could also ask her a question. They could tell from her eyes, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. So as a rule of thumb, you have your CPA meet or your attorney with the IRS. I know nothing. And I say, I don't know. So I get a list of questions, I review them with her, and then we strategically then get the information together to make, have an appropriate response. That strategy I've been doing for 40 years, and it is very effective.